Um, hi everyone, I'm Matt Hitchcock. Um, I'm currently studying a PhD in Iron Age Archaeology at University of Manchester. But I thought this session would be a good chance to bore you, I mean talk to you about uh, archives. Um, I'm actually glad that Gavin Lucas's um, keynote lecture last night touched on archives as well. <clears throat> I'm going to share with you uh, some of my work with the personal archives of Paul Jakobstahl and Martin Job, who are two uh, great scholars of Iron Age archaeology, I'm sure some of you are familiar with them. And this is really a story about the production their two seminal volumes on uh, Celtic art. As Oliver and James have said, the main aim of this session is, open, is to open up a dialogue between scholars working in or on different areas of Europe or different time periods and to think about ways of overcoming these intellectual silos which can emerge within different academic institutions or traditions. So the main theme of this paper is to uh, highlight the facilitating and constraining effects that these institutions and traditions can have on scholarship and the ways that this shapes the production of knowledge about the past. Uh, through cataloguing the notes, sketches, photographs and letters of these two academics, their parts in an intricate and much wider network of scholars and objects based around Oxford University became apparent. And it also revealed one of these very insular intellectual silos of knowledge about European Celtic art which had emerged over decades and is still been unravelled feel like Alex's um, theoretical coach that we've all been riding on for the past couple of hours has like, finally arrived in Oxford, here we are. Uh, so I first came into contact with the Jakob Stahl and Joke material when I started volunteering at the archives um, at Oxford University Archaeology Department with Sally Crawford and Katharina Olmschneider, and I quickly realised it was an incredibly valuable and largely overlooked resource. As Schlanger and Norblad have said, consulting an archive allows us to access an extra dimension of the, the archaeological process to really delve into its forefront and engage with those operational practices that are often left unsaid or unpublished. Initial ideas, intuitions and connections were made visible, from no, knowing only what I'd read in their publications for a literature review, which I never wrote in the end, um, suddenly I could see how they analysed the, uh, the objects that they uh, wrote about and how they formed their ideas. Letters revealed who they wrote to and journals re revealed where they'd been. This isn't to say that the archives represented any sort of complete picture, and in many ways, dealing with them was similar to an archaeological excavation. Some things were purposely deposited, other things were incidental, and much of it was fragmented. Each archive had a kind of str stratigraphic chronology, which was sometimes quite ordered and in other places churned up. This is just an analogy, of course, I don't want to push it too far. But I did feel as though having an archaeological background maybe approached the archive in a different way to perhaps a historian would have. In any case, it presented a unique insight into the production of these two important publications and also turned up a series of surprising finds. I'll start with Jakobstahl. It's a very good, very good picture, I can find a better one. Um, Paul Jakobstahl had a keen interest in ancient Greek art and sculpture and became a professor of classical archaeology at the University of Marburg in Germany in 1912. Uh, and Jakobstahl had also developed an interest in Celtic art after identifying a series of similarities and possible links between Greek and Celtic bronzes. However, in 1936, like many Jewish people in positions of office in Nazi Germany, he was dismissed from his post at the university. Jakob Stoll had spent years visiting, <coughs> visiting objects, collecting photographs and compiling notes for his publication on early Celtic art, and amongst others. And all of this research was seized by the university, except for what little a few loyal students could pass to him through a window. Fortunately, though, for Jakob Stoll, he'd already built up a degree of international renown, and he developed a good relationship with Sir John Beasley, a professor of classics at Oxford University, and with Beasley's help, Jakob Stoll secured a lectureship at Oxford and relocated there at what turned out to have been just the right time. Although Jakob Stoll continued to study and teach classical art, he was determined to finish the catalogue of Iron Age Celtic artefacts from Europe, which he'd started in Germany. But first, he had to replenish his stock of photographs remotely, writing to various friends and colleagues on the continent. Despite him being aware of the fact that he escaped a fate that would have almost certainly been much worse if he uh, stayed in Germany, Jakob Stahl's life in Britain was far from easy. He writes to an old friend in Germany saying that despite the level of academic respect he'd received from many people at Oxford, he would all, always be seen as a bloody foreigner with strange habits and quirky ways. Jakob Stahl's archive was already very orderly and been uh, very well catalogued by the volunteers and researchers at the Institute thanks to grants from the Heritage Lottery Fund and the Reaver and David Logan Foundation in 2010. A first pass through it by Sally and Katerina had revealed an unpublished manuscript which they published recently in their edited volume. Notice that it was on sale for a really good price in the book bit, so you know, if anyone's that way inclined. Half of it was a paper about four British and Irish sword scabbards and the other half, entitled Leopold, Leopold Bloom I, 
was a joking skit centred around an Iron Age ancestor uh, of the Jewish protagonist from James Joyce's Ulysses, who travels from Hungary to Lincoln. Jakobsall uses this satirical story to posit an explanation as to why there are apparently Hungarian motifs uh, present on the Witham sword that was found in Lincolnshire, right? Yeah. Um, and that this might, may have been the result of a single travelling craftsman. Jakobsall only circulated this article, which started as a birthday gift to Beasley, with a select few scholars, and he resisted a lot of subsequent uh, pressure to publish it, such as from his good friend Hugh Henkin at Harvard. The team were actually able to coordinate with the Peabody Museum at Harvard to get both sides of the correspondence between uh, Jakobsdahl and Henkin. So uh, uh, <coughs> after we learned that Jakobsdahl had finally turned down an offer to publish Leopold Bloom, Henkin says, Dear Jakobsdahl, I was afraid that you might feel this way about Leopold Bloom, but you see, we believe in fun in archaeology. I should have thought that anyone as distinguished as yourself would have no fear of being considered anything but a serious scholar. I do not bother much about what people think of me and my papers, replies Jakobstahl, but I really feel that this paper is dangerous stuff, should be marked with a skull and two bones crossed, and kept in the cupboard at my shop, and shown only to the very, very few. Despite what he admitted to Henkin, it seems that Jakobstahl was very influenced by the threat of scorn from other academics in the community, and it seems he was particularly worried about his colleague Cyril Fox. This really highlighted just how much that working within the framework of an institution, and even within the invisible college, as Margarita Diaz put it, of international scholars in your field, can affect how or even whether knowledge that you've produced about the past ever makes it out into the public sphere. One of the things which he did publish was early Celtic art in 1944, and my work on the Jakobsal archive, built on this cataloguing and research by the team, to examine how his classical and art historical approach shaped this archaeological publication. Jakob Stahl never took part in any actual excavation, as far as we know. And like I said earlier, he relied largely on photographs of objects for his analysis. Like Jennifer Baird and Leslie McFadgen have pointed out, photographs serve as a kind of site of translation between archaeological material and the production of knowledge. And in this case, it resulted in a heavy emphasis on the visual nature of Celtic art. Jakob Sol reads Celtic art objects like text, referring to their uh, style and decoration as a kind of grammar. Although Christopher Hawkes is a fan of Jakob Stahl's, he picked up on the single-minded interest in form over function and his reluctance to use what he calls laboratory definitions of materials. Previous to publishing uh, early Celtic art, Jakob Stahl had been of, of the view that the analysis of the Celtic soul should not be an archaeologist's concern. Rather, he said, we should merely be tasked with describing what is visibly and clearly expressed in stone, bronze, or clay. And we can see from the Jakobstahl archive that Jakobstahl's approach is very ordered and meticulous. But something about Jakobstahl's upheaval and tumultuous experience since being forced out of Marburg had changed his mind about what was once to be merely a catalogue. Early Celtic art offers a rich and sensitive interpretation of this Iron Age metalwork, which to Jakobstahl was a medium of contrasts an alternate vision of reality to classical art, but one which he saw as no less real. After early Celtic art, Jakob Stahl had intended to follow up with a second volume on British insular material, and work on this had been underway since well before the publication on the, of the Continental volume. However, Jakob Stahl was already in his 50s when he arrived in Britain, and by the 1950s he increasingly uh, required assistance in his work. To help with the British volume, Jakob Stahl enlisted the help of Martin Jope as his assistant and collaborator. In contrast to Jakob Stahl's background in classics, Job studied chemistry at Oxford and had been working as a biochemist during the war. He developed an interest in uh, archaeology at university and he'd excavated extensively uh, and eventually secured a lectureship in archaeology at Queen's University Belfast, although he spent most of his time back in Oxford, spare time. The two academics had only been working off and on with each other for about a year or so before Jakob Stahl died in 1957. And for a time afterwards, Job was allowed to use Jakob Stahl's office at Christchurch College and was given free access to his notes and research, and Job continued to work on what was to be early Celtic art in the British Isles. As a chemist, Job was much more interested in the materials used in Celtic art objects and the production methods of composite artefacts. Uh, here we can see his uh, analysis of the elemental compositions of the Minster Ditch Dagger and the Stan Lake Sword. But as well as being scientific, Job also uh, looked at art history and even to music to expand the repertoire of words used to describe Celtic art objects. This resulted in an extremely uh, evocative and sensual style of description, 
I'll read you a small but representative excerpt from his description of one of the Lisnacrogger sword scabbards, Iron Age scabbards from Northern Ireland. A sinuous continuing thread thus meanders through the composition, from the top right hand sickle end trumpet right down into the chape tip. At the bottom, one smaller volute penetrates into the chape frame, and below this, the strand meanders down like a stream through pools in the bends fed by winding tributaries. Chris Gosden argues that the, this theoretically informed interest in the object, combined, combined with his proficient ability to describe, uh, <coughs> enabled Job to develop uh, his own kind of archaeological thick description, a term first used by Clifford Geertz, and that Job's sensory and sensual engagement with objects led to a desire to understand, explore, compare and evoke, and through this, some of the original Iron Age charge of the objects come through. This surprising find during my, uh, writing my dissertation, when Sally pulled it out of a cupboard, just uh, shows how far this sensual engagement of Job's went. He's literally taken a piece of tracing paper and laid it over the Lisnacrogger sword scabbards and rubbed pretty hard with a pencil to make these impressions. And then he's traced over the uh, swirling motifs in red pen. Um, as much as this might make the conservatory in you cringe, it certainly made me cringe, uh, <clears throat> you can see how Job's eagerness to get stuck in cultivated this real sense of intimacy. Job first mentions the early Celtic art in British Isles is impressed in 1971. However, this never happened, and Job continued to push the publication back, date back through the 70s and into the 80s. And it could perhaps be explained in the way which Job worked. And like Jakob Stahl's very orderly archive, Job's was chaotic, vast, and had hardly been touched since uh, it arrived at the Institute archives. Sections of printed drafts from various points in time were scattered amongst the boxes, and there were instances of Job obsessively handwriting the same section of text day after day. Other than Cyril Fox's pattern and purpose, there was no real comprehensive catalogue of Iron Age uh, artefacts from Britain, and Job's volume constantly being on the verge of publication put other people off from working on something similar. For years, Job held a kind of monopoly on this subject, uh, sitting on the research he and Jakob Stoll had produced, despite completing uh, other smaller publications in the meantime. I think if he had published it in the uh, 60s or early 70s, as originally planned, it would have had a much greater impact on Iron Age archaeology. Mansell Spratling's work on the Southern British Bronzes in the 70s, for example, would have probably been quite different. The publication date almost became a running joke in the end, and despite eventually accepting help from Ian Stead in particular, Job never managed to finish it before he died, and it was published posthumously in 2000, over 40 years after it had first been accepted by Oxford University Press. He instead ended up writing the preface, as Job never got round to it, and noted that Jakob Stoll had left no usable material to the volume uh, to Job. Uh, he goes on to say that Job originally wanted this book to be a collaboration, but the present text is entirely the work of Job. However, in Job's archive, there turned out to be over 70 pages of Jakob Stahl's original typescript for early Celtic art in the British Isles. It had been typed on Jakob Stahl's typewriter, and uh, it had handwritten revisions by Job on top. Job had helped himself to this and other notes and photographs during the time in which he used his office. I'm not suggesting that Job completely plagiarised this material. He definitely edited it and added much, much more to it. But um, Jakob Stahl's catalogue entries, photographs, and art historical style of description are definitely still present in the work. For it to be solely credited to Job is, in light of these findings, perhaps a little unfair. Knowing how to disseminate your intellectual property in the right way is rarely easy. And this example has highlighted the conflict which can occur between your own interests, that of your institution, and that of your subject area. This hoarding of knowledge and research, I argue, had quite a profound effect on the study of Iron Age Britain in the second half of the 20th century. It really demonstrates the importance of sessions like this, which aim to get academics from parallel worlds working together, discussing ideas and sharing research for the benefit of everyone. I've only been able to give you a snapshot of the network of scholars who were involved in this legacy of Celtic studies at Oxford, which began with Arthur Evans and his uh, father's finds from Holstadt and involved E.T. Leeds, uh, T.H. Lawrence, Cyril Fox, Christopher Hawkes, and of course, Jack Stoll and Job, uh, which I was able to unravel through spending days pouring through dusty basements and uh, through dark boxes in, du in dusty basements. Um, it really showcased just how much the stories that we choose to tell about the past are shaped by the circumstances in which we work and who we work with. I hope I've also demonstrated the power that archives have to make us look in new ways about uh, how our academic pre predecessors operated, and just as importantly, about how we operate ourselves. Thanks.